Um, if this is your first time at Community at Coast, we're glad you're here. We have an opportunity to jump in the Word together and then invest into relationships. We spend time here in the Word and then we break out into life groups um, where we get to dive in a little bit uh, deeper. Um, just for a way of announcements, I know uh, last week, last week you guys had your dinner uh, outside together, a little time of fellowship. Um, this next uh, Wednesday will be our worship, uh, worship night starting at 6.30. So come here, we'll have a time of worship together as we prepare our hearts uh, for Thanksgiving. And then Thanksgiving week uh, is on Thursday, the following, the following week, right? Uh, so we're not gonna do uh, our Wednesday here in-house. Um, we're gonna allow you guys, being that it's Thanksgiving week, we wanna give you guys some freedom. We know probably the day before doesn't work well uh, for everybody being the day before Thanksgiving. So what we're gonna do is pre-record the teaching for you guys, and we're going to put that online on Sunday, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Uh, so you guys can, with your life groups, decide on what's the best time for you guys that week to go into the teaching together and uh, spend some time there. We will still have it posted up on, uh, at 6.30 on that Wednesday for those that join, want to join in at that same time, but it will be there in the archives for you guys uh, early on so you guys can figure out what works best for you. Make sense? Good. We're going to be continuing on in the life of Christ. We'll find ourselves continuing on in Mark uh, chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Um, just to recap for you guys, we are in the week of the Passion Week, right? Jesus just rode in on a donkey. Uh, last week, Pastor Chet talked about his triumphal entry, riding in on a donkey coming before the people, going on into Jerusalem, and they are praising and worshiping Hosanna, Hosanna, right? This is where we find ourselves. And I'm going to be in, uh, continuing on, and we're going to read in Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 12. Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 12. Let me just read the little section we'll be going in together, and then I'll pray. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find some things on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again, and his disciples heard it. Let's pray. God, as we are coming to your word now, what I believe for our church, for those listening, for myself, Lord, this word is for us. So God, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what you have to say. You know where we are coming from, what season of life we're in, what home is like, what work is like, what family is like, what situations we're walking through, Lord, you know and you see all things. And you've given us this word. So Lord, I pray that you give us ears to hear and hearts that are able to receive. Lord, would you give me every gift necessary in order to communicate what you have to say to your people? And Lord, that we would be edified and built up for your glory, I pray. Amen. So Mark chapter 11, right? Jesus has just ridden in on a donkey. And Pastor Chad talked about last week that this desire that God has for true worship, not just the praise of our lips, and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, these same people that were worshiping him there in that moment were the same ones that would be crying out, crucify him, crucify him. So this desire for true worship to be in the hearts of his people. We are still in the same, same event, right? This is the last week of, of Christ's life. So in his last week, obviously the things that he is teaching he has a specific purpose, they are meaningful, he has no time to waste, and the things that he is teaching are important to him. Now let me read that passage again. Um, the withered fig tree, starting in verse 12. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, after the triumphal entry, the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. They were heading into Jerusalem. He was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find some things on it. 
When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard from it. You first read there, you're like, man, what a case of hangry Jesus, right? Like, man, he is hungry. Someone get that man a Kit Kat bar, right? You remember those commercials with Kit Kats, right? Okay. All right. So someone get that man a Kit Kat bar. And I'm thinking to myself, well, there's obviously a reason for Jesus doing these things. It's his last week. Remember, let's get back into the moment of where he is. He's again and again told his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. I'm going to give my life for you. I'm going to be crucified. I'll be handed over. This is his aim. He set his face like a flint. He was on his way to Jerusalem. There's a purpose for this. This isn't just hangry Jesus. I've been thinking about the times where in scripture it talks about Jesus being hungry. And I was reminded of a couple times, right? After Jesus fasted 40 days in the wilderness as he was led away, it says he was hungry. After he fasted 40 days, we're like, obviously, he was hungry. But then he was tempted by the devil and he says, and he says, man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out the mouth of the Lord. There was a reason for his hunger. He was trying to teach a lesson. And the next one I'm thinking about is after his resurrection, he comes and appears to his disciples. And he says, hey, give me something to eat. And they feed him fish. And that was to, to show his disciples that it wasn't just the spirit of Jesus being risen from the dead, but the actual body of Jesus. He was himself raised from the dead. The man Jesus was raised from the dead, and he ate food to show them that he had hunger. It was, it was body. It was him that was risen from the dead. There was a purpose for his hunger. The one that sticks out the most to me was, um, you, you know, the woman at the well. And Jesus was weary and tired from his journey and hungry, and he sends his disciples off to get something to eat, and he's sitting at the well, and what does he do? And he ministers to this woman, right? He tells her everything that she has done, and she's like, man, you must be a prophet. And he says, I am standing before you. I am the one you're waiting for. I am the Messiah, right? And his disciples come back to him, and they're like, hey, like, who gave this man something to eat? And his response is, I have food to eat of which you know not of. He uses his hunger to teach lessons. I have food that you you do not know of. My food is to do, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's what he said about his hunger. My job is, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. It is to finish his work. All these examples of his hunger were to teach a lesson. Even in his hunger, he was teaching. Everything that Jesus did was in order to edify or build up his disciples. So here, Jesus is hungry again, right? So are we learning the lesson that Jesus has to teach us? There's obviously a lesson here. Every time he was hungry, he taught something. So Jesus is hungry. He is hungry seeing a fig tree at a distance. I want us to see Mark chapter 11 this Verses 12 through 14, I wanted to see it as an object lesson. Jesus is teaching something to his disciples and then therefore teaching something to us. Now, big picture to back up so we can see the object lesson. Malachi chapter 3, if you want to write this down, Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, talks about Jesus coming into Jerusalem and the point of it, right? Jesus has just rode in on a donkey and he's coming to Jerusalem. And in Malachi chapter 3, it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. The Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts, coming into his temple. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. Refining fire, a launderer's soap, something that's meant to cleanse. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi. Do you hear what his purpose is in coming into the temple? Do you hear his purpose of coming into Jerusalem? He is there to purify. He is there to cleanse. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. Purge, purify. They will 
that they, so that they, or that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. True worship, a true praise, a true offering in righteousness. He was there to purify, to, pur- to purge, to cleanse his people. That's why he's coming into Jerusalem. And the people of Jerusalem were ignorant to this. Remember, he's riding in on a donkey. Imagine the scene around him. Remember in Luke chapter 19, Pastor Chet kind of touched on it last, last time. As he drew near to the city, he saw the city in Luke chapter 19, verse 41. He saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. He wanted them to find peace in him. He wanted to cleanse them. He wanted to purify them. He saw the city of, Jer- of Jerusalem and wept over it. This isn't just hangry Jesus, just hungry and just filled with emotion because he didn't get what he wanted. Right? This is Jesus seeing his people and teaching them a lesson. He's using this fig tree as a lesson. See, The people of Israel, in verse 44 of Luke chapter 19, it says, because you did not know the time of your visitation. They weren't aware of the time. They didn't see Jesus as coming to be their purifier. He's riding in on a a donkey, and imagine the scene, right? People are coming into Jerusalem. People are walking alongside him, and where are they going? They're going to celebrate the Passover. So they're probably bringing their lambs, They're probably bringing in their sacrifices. They're coming as a family to remember the passing over of the Lord. The sacrifice was made for their cleansing that they would not experience death as in the times of old. And they are coming into Jerusalem and their true sacrifice is riding in on a donkey. And they're shouting out, Hosanna, save, save. But what are they wanting to be saved from? Save us, save us. Was it to save them from the Romans? That they can be delivered? Or did they really see the need for salvation in them being purified? Did they really see, save me from myself? Save me, save me, save me from what's within. Did they see their real need for purifying? Did they see their real need for cleansing? Jesus says it himself. You didn't know the hour of your visitation. He was weeping over them. They did not know their need for peace, the things that would make them have peace, Jesus himself. They should have been ready. They've been celebrating this for some time. And Jesus is weeping over it and comes now to this verse 12, this object lesson for them to see. They were missing it, and Jesus wanted to point it out. If you're going to write a title to this teaching, I would write, Jesus wants true fruit, not the appearance of godliness. Jesus or Jesus wants true godliness, godliness, not the appearance of it. He's looking for true fruit. So let me read again verse 12. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. He was hungry. If you can write a point down, Jesus desires spiritual fruit. He was hungry. He had a desire. He's looking for fruit on this fig tree. And just this lesson here that he's trying to teach, you look at verse 13, and seeing from afar afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if it perhaps he would find something on it. He saw this fig tree from afar off, seeing that he had leaves, seeing that it should have fruit because he was hungry, and went to go see what was on it, if he could find anything on it. If he could find anything on it. Uh, This looks very familiar to uh, verse 11 of Mark chapter 11. After Jesus rides in on a donkey in his triumphal entry, it says he rides into the temple. He goes in and goes into the temple. Look at verse 11. And Jesus went into Jerusalem... And into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. He went into the temple and looked around. What did he see? 
Right, he's, he's riding in as people are coming into Jerusalem with all their sacrifices, missing the true sacrifice. He goes into the temple and looks around. What does he see? Well, we know later on in this story in chapter 11, he, the next day he goes into the temple, and that's when he flips over tables, right, and drives out the money changers. There is hypocrisy happening all over in the temple. All these signs of worship but really after their own gain. He goes in and turns tables. So when he's in the temple in verse 11 and he's looking around, I'm sure he's seeing the same thing happening. I'm sure he's seeing the appearance of godliness, but no real fruit. He's seeing all these things and he's looking around, goes and inspects it, and then leaves in verse 11. Now he's coming out of Bethany in chapter 12, and sees a fig tree afar off that looks like it has an appearance of godliness, like Jerusalem. It should have had the appearance of God. It should be godly, but only has the appearance. And he goes and inspects it like he does in the temple on verse 11. He goes and inspects it. See, Jesus desires spiritual fruit. Jesus desires spiritual fruit. We're also going to be looking in John chapter 15. I'm going to read a passage for you in John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. See, fruit bearing, which Jesus desires, is what glorifies the Father. This glorifies them by us bearing fruit. Also, it states in John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. I chose you for this work that you should go and bear fruit. This is what Jesus desires, fruit bearing. It glorifies the Father. This is what he's after, this fruit bearing. Well, what is this fruit? Well, Galatians chapter 5, you guys can look at it and you guys will look at it later in your groups. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, it lists out the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it lists, it lists the, the uh, definition of love, patient, kind, does not envy, does not boast, does not parade itself, is not provoke, rejoices in righteousness, does not rejoice in falsehood, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. These true fruit that God is after because it glorifies him and is what he's appointed us for. Now this fig tree had the appearance of having fruit. This fig tree had the appearance of having fruit. And he went to see, verse 13, and he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. This is what I love about Jesus. He's not just quick and irrational, right? But he goes and inspects. If you want to write a point down, Jesus can discern hypocrisy. Jesus can discern hypocrisy. Looking from afar off, this fig tree looked like it should have figs on it. It had leaves on it but he went to inspect it. He goes and investigates and brings truth to light. That's what we know of the word, right? The, law, the, the word is able to discern our thoughts and motives. So he goes and inspects this, this tree. He can discern hypocrisy. And what does he find? He finds nothing but leaves, nothing but leaves on this tree, right? The fig tree, when it blossoms or it has leaves, it comes with figs. When the tree, a fig tree would produce leaves, it would also produce figs. It says here, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Yet, yet it showed signs of bearing fruit. It had the appearance of having fruit. It's not saying here that, oh, this tree was probably just plucked from, that someone came in and gathered the figs early on and he just came there and there was nothing left. It wasn't even the season for figs. 
right? Uh, according to scholars, the next following month would be the season for figs to be born. But this tree specifically, for the lesson he was trying to teach his disciples, it had leaves on it. It should have had figs, but it was all just a show. It was all just a show, and Jesus is making a lesson out of it, like the people of Israel. They had this appearance of godliness, yet there was no real fruit. There was no real fruit. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, Lord, for me, for me as a Christian, what are you trying to point out in me? As a follower of you, is there any, anything in me that you're discerning of hypocrisy? There's this appearance of godliness that I have, but is it real fruit? Is it real fruit that you see in me? And I, and I happen to be in my, my devils this morning in Proverbs chapter 16. And it says, the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the motives. The Lord weighs the motives. He goes and inspects. He can inspect his hypocrisy. He can go and discern what are the true motives behind my actions. Because let's be real, it can be easy to put on a front. It can be easy to play church. Oh, well, I do my, my devos in the morning. I read my Bible. I, I go to church on Sunday and even Wednesday sometimes. I, I, I do the right things. I don't curse I don't swear, I've stopped drinking, I don't do drugs, I've cleaned up my life. But how are the motives behind the things that I'm doing? Jesus can see past the front and is there to inspect for true fruit. It should have been there. There should have been fruit on this tree. What I, I find something that challenges me often when it comes to if I am bearing true fruit, it comes to me inspecting my tongue. All, all throughout the scriptures, there's this, uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 12. If you guys can turn to Matthew chapter 12, looking at verse 33. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, talks about the tongue. Talks about how a tree, a tree is known by its fruit. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Right? You can know an apple tree by the fruit of an apple. You can know an orange tree by the fruits of orange. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Do you want to see what's in your heart? You want to see what comes out of your heart? Let's look at your mouth. A good man out of good treasures of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasures of his his heart brings forth evil things in the way that he speaks. But I say to you that every idle word a man speaks, he will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Every careless word Every word that just comes off the top that I'm not really thinking about, that when I just, I'm just talking and just having a conversation with someone, just chit-chatting, every word that just flows out my tongue carelessly, right? Every word in just a normal conversation, I will be judged by, the Bible says. For by your, why? For by your words, you will be justified. Why, Lord? And by your words, you will be condemned because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you can look at the way I talk and what I say in just my, my flipping conversations. If I'm joking around, is it crass? Is it, does my words edify? Does it build up? Right? Jesus challenges the motives of the heart, the outflow of the heart. He says he will judge us by his words. It's easy to put on a front, but these motives, the things that just roll off my tongue, the things that I say in casual conversation, is it bearing real fruit? Is love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control, is that just overflowing in my life? And Jesus here is judging this fig tree. Let's continue on in Mark chapter 11. 
When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And he judges the fig tree. Jesus judges hypocrisy. He judges this fig tree. And you think, man, this is just, Jesus, you were really quick at, at just cursing this fig tree. And no one's ever going to eat from you again. Later on in chapter 11, the disciples come up upon the fig tree and it's withered from the roots, it says. Completely withered. Jesus speaks a word and it dies. And Jesus, you are very harsh in this moment. Well, again, take this as an object lesson for the disciples, for the people of Israel, and for us. Jesus takes hypocrisy very seriously. The appearance of godliness, but no real fruit. He takes it seriously. This is the first time we see a destructive work of Jesus, right? The cursing of a fig tree. Later on, we're about to see him go in and flip tables. He's preparing his disciples for what he's about to do. He's judging hypocrisy. And he curses this fig tree, but yet he was there the day before in the temple and seeing all the hypocrisy and giving them a chance. Jesus is patient with his people. He is patient with the people of Israel. And yet he's giving them this object lesson. Jesus here is warning his people. So are they going to heed his warning? And for us today, do we heed his warning? How seriously he takes hypocrisy. He is after true fruit bearing and not just appearances. Not just the appearance of godliness, but what's in our heart. Let's actually look down in verse 20. Now in the morning, after Jesus goes in and cleanses the temple, we backtrack and we're seeing what happens to this fig tree. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter remarked, saying to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. It was dried up from the roots, it says. It was dried up from from the roots. If you want to write down uh, another point, rooted in self is death, but rooted in Christ bears fruit. Rooted in self is death. Rooted in Christ bears fruit. When we are showing the appearance of godliness and not actually producing any real fruit, we're really just operating in self. The people of Israel were missing Christ. They didn't see the true sacrifice. They weren't abiding in him, therefore not producing real fruit. You see it in the lives of the Pharisees. They were producing an appearance of godliness, but no real fruit. They were rooted in self, and rooted in self is death, but rooted in Christ bears fruit. John chapter 15, John chapter 15 speaks of fruitlessness apart from Christ. In John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Again, this analogy of abiding in a vine, comparing us to a vine, he says, unless you abide in me, the true vine, you cannot bear it any fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, verse 5, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without abiding in me, you can do nothing. The people of Israel were missing the true sacrifice, missing the true point of him riding in Israel was that he would be their atonement, that he would be their peace, that he would be their cleansing, that they needed him. And they've been missing it all along. And he's showing them by this withered tree that apart from him, they can do nothing. Us, apart from abiding in him, we can do nothing. In order to bear fruit, we must abide in him. And in abiding in him, there is a sense of death. I can't have anything of me in and of myself. From the roots, 
it withered away when he cursed it. And remember, Jesus is about to go into Jerusalem to make a sacrifice. Why? That he would become our curse. Right? That he would take upon himself the curse of all people. And he himself would be a curse. That when we abide in him, we are accepting his death as our own. That we have been crucified with him. So we would have to experience our own death in order for there to be true life. In order for us to bear fruit, we must die to self from the roots in order to have a real life rooted in Christ, that he would be the vine that we abide in. To write a point down, it's through abiding in him that we produce fruit. It's in true abiding in him that we produce fruit. Abiding in him. What does it mean to abide, to have our home or abode? When I think of my home, my abode, I think of my house, I put my house in order because it fits me, right? The way I've arranged my house from my living room, the way I have my chairs set up in my living room, I have my chairs set up in my living room that they would face all together because I want people when they walk into my house for it to be a time of like gathering together and a time of conversation. So I have my TV on the wall and then I have a chairs facing together. I've made my home the way it is because it's my home. It's, the, it's where I want it to be. It suits me. In the kitchen, you're not gonna find a toaster because I'm a, I have a gluten allergy and you're not gonna be finding any, any toast being made in my kitchen because it fits me. We have one in there in case Diana wants some toast, she can bring it down. But for me, there's no toaster in the, in, in the kitchen because it's my home. It's my home. So what does it mean to abide in Christ? Let's look at verse seven of, of John chapter 15. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. This is something that Jesus also says in John chapter 14, very parallel. It says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and will, make, and will come to him and make our home with him. We will make our home in you if you abide in my word, if my word abides in you, if you're obedient to my commandments, this is home. If my word abides in you, you will bear much fruit. So I'm thinking to myself, does, does his word have a home in me? Is my heart arranged in such a way where the word finds home in me? Are things set in order where his word has such a place in my heart that my heart is decorated according to his word, decorated the way that he sees fit? See, it's only in abiding in him, abiding in his word, being obedient to his word that we are to bear much fruit. And that's what Jesus is after, right? Again, this is his last week before his crucifixion and he's driving home a point. And therefore, I believe driving home a point for us. He desires us to bear fruit. And the only way we can bear fruit is if we're truly abiding in him. So, are we abiding? Does his word have a place in our hearts? Does, is, is his word where we find home? Where we find our security, our direction, our comfort, how we organize our life? Is this what we're finding it's easy for me to put on a show. But what's coming out of my mouth? What, is my, what are my actions like? Am I really a person of love? Can it be seen? Not that there's just an appearance of it, but is there real fruit? And Jesus is after that. Jesus is after that with his disciples. That's the purpose he's coming into Jerusalem. He's there to cleanse them, that they would abide in them, that he would, they would abide in him, and that his father would be glorified in them bearing much fruit. And is that what we're doing? Are we those that are bearing fruit because that's what glorifies him? Maybe we are, we are a bearing fruit. Maybe we are growing. You guys are here, the double dippers. You're here to, to get more of his word. And maybe you are bearing fruit. Um, but verse 15, it says, I am the true vine and my father, father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes 
that it may bear more fruit. That it may bear more fruit. Jesus is after fruit in our life. Jesus is after that we bear more fruit. Sometimes it's very easy to get complacent. So it's very easy to get complacent. I've put these things out of my life and I've done these things, but the Lord is asking for us to bear fruit and he's after it. So is there anything in our hearts that we see might just have the appearance of godliness, but the real motives behind our heart is, needs to change? He's desiring for us to have more fruit. Is he coming in with his word and pointing things out for us? Are there circumstances in our life that we're, we're, we're at bearing fruit, we're pressing in, we've gone through the season as a church together in COVID and we're pressing in together and it seems like circumstances happen and change happens or and it's like, man, this was this, we're, we're bearing fruit, why is this change happening and yet the Lord is after us bearing fruit. There's a season of pruning. There's a season of cutting back. There's a season of testing. There's a season of challenge. And the desire is that we would bear more fruit. And this, I believe, is our word for us today. As the Lord comes in and inspects our heart, as we spend time in the word, is he seeing any hypocrisy? Or is he finding real fruit? And Jesus is there to prune, not just to be harsh, not just to warn us of hypocrisy, but he desires us to bear fruit Because let's look at, I'm going to read this for you in chapter 15 of John again. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that we would bear fruit, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. He desires us to abide in him, to produce produce fruit, that we would glorify God because in it we will find our joy. See, the things that the Lord does isn't just a flippant move of emotion, but he's reason behind all of it. It's to glorify the Father and is also for our good. So are we going to take this heed of warning that we would be those that don't have the appearance of godliness but are actually bearing much fruit because this glorifies him? Let's pray. God, we, we see this, this fig tree, this object lesson that you're giving your disciples, calling out hypocrisy in Israel as you're riding in on your last week about to turn over tables, addressing hypocrisy, or telling us that your desire, your hunger for real fruit. And God, I pray that as we spend time, more time in your word, as we hear this lesson, that you would in our times and groups together, that you would point out any places in our hearts where there is an appearance of godliness but no real fruit, that we would abide in you, that you would change our hearts, that we would grow in heeding your word and allow you to be God and produce more fruit in our lives. Lord, we trust you that the ways that you do this is for our good and for our joy. So, Lord, we ask that you would have your way tonight, that there would be honest, open conversations, and, Lord, that we would grow as a people that bear much fruit and would be pleasing in your sight. It's in your name and for your glory we pray. Amen.